good, good morning, everybody. Amen. Can you say good morning to my great friends, uh, Brother Theo and Sister F Apostle Fanny Minnett over here on my left? Can I ask her to stand, please? Just amen. Great man and woman of God. She teaches the chaplaincy course at ECU and is the president of the the Fanny Minute World Ministries. Yesterday we did something unique. If you go on our website at ECU Jamaica or on the um, ECU well, Facebook YouTube page, you'll see a telethon. Now you've heard Daystar, Day, was it Daystar? Have their telethon and TV and have their telethon. Well, we had our telethon. We had on YouTube, on Facebook, sharing with people the vision and inviting people to participate. And I just want to say publicly and to everybody here, uh, Betty and I are so thankful for you, uh, Apostle Fanny Minute, for your encouragement, for your nudging, <laughs> for your, your, your blessing in the Lord to enable us to be a part of this. And, you know, I, I was calculating Pastor Knox. Uh, he, Pastor Knox was teasing me about my gray hair. And I think you guys have known us when there was red hair. <laughs> and four little kids running around, right? And I'm thinking in, well, just if I just only look at 20 years, um, because I remember when we moved up from Jamaica in 1999, and I remember when, you know, we were so broken, and I remember how, you know, Grady and Rose opened up their home and took us in and led us through that whole teaching by John Bevere, Right about the bait of Satan. You remember? You guys remember that teaching? Went through that whole teaching with us because we had just went through an experience in ministry where we were like, oh, "Man, this guy just stopped being the back," <laughs> and you you wanted to pull the knife out and run for you know. And we found out that healing came at the cross. Come on, somebody. You know, if you dance with somebody, it's okay. They may step on your toe. The problem is when you get somebody step on the toe, you don't want to dance no more. But the healing comes means you need to keep dancing. And so I'm telling you that we remember the investment of time. I remember when we were pastoring in Port Charlotte, 2003, and we were pastoring in Port Charlotte International Church. In fact, I remember the time I came here, 19, when, and I received my citizenship. This was the first church I preached in. I still remember what I preached that, that Sunday was a message about Paul was saying that he became a citizen and they were asking him who he was and, uh, and, and, and that God had given that um, right for his divine purpose. I remember that message. It was right here in, the, at, um, in this church. Every significant thing that has happened in our lives, really in the last 30 years, you guys have been a key part of it. I mean, when we were pastor in Port Charlotte, like I said, 2003, um, we weren't even thinking about going back to Jamaica. Paula, you remember? And you guys? You keep praying for us to go back to Jamaica. Well, you, well, you keep praying. Yeah, I know. But I meant you prayed for the will of God in our lives. I would call Sister Rose and she said, how are you doing? We're fine. How is Jamaica? I'm like, I'm in Port Charlotte. <laughs> but she would pray about the vision because... You know, Grady and Sister Rose, when we were directors at um, Caribbean Christ of the Nations, that, that's when your church and you here started supporting the work of Jamaica. You invested in helping us to grow some bananas and to grow, open up the farm so we could actually feed ourselves in that cafeteria. So, you know, uh, Pastor and I, I, I was just looking. This church has been one of the churches where nobody else thought, us, thought about us as missionaries. When I say nobody else... I mean, nobody else, no other church, no other group. Every month when we were pioneering in that church in Port Charlotte, we knew that a leader would send at least $200 a month to support us. Can I tell you that sometimes that was all we had? Some months that was all we had. We had to raise four children. We had to do the work of the ministry. We had to... We had an after school going. We we're doing all that stuff. And uh, some people, they, do, they thought we had it all. But it was one church. 
that's to do it. You know, I just calculated just 20 years of doing that. That's almost $48,000 that you invested in our life and ministry. And you did more than that many years. Some Christmas time, there would be an extra gift that the church would send to us. And sometimes we would come to preach like this and you do more. So I know it's more than $48,000. There's been thousands of dollars that you've invested in the life and the ministry of Peter and Betty Burnett and our four kids. And, um, you know, when you throw a pebble in the water, the impact is not just where the pebble falls, is it? There's a ripple effect. And there has been a ripple effect over these 30 years or so since I, I had that citizenship, gained that citizenship. We were, used to laugh because I would say in Jamaica, Betty was the resident alien. <laughs> and then when I came to America, I was the resident alien. <laughs> so I said, we are all aliens, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, so... Now, she's, now she's, she's getting close to her, you know, she can do whatever she wants in Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> what? Amen, amen. But, you know, I'm telling you that, I, I, I told people that I'm also a Jew. Yeah, I'm a Jew-Macon. <laughs> that, that's me right there. <laughs> no, <that's good. laughs> but... Uh, but actually, there are also many Jews in Jamaica, you know, a lot of, uh, in, in, all over the Caribbean as well. But uh, it's just really amazing. I just sit there remembering. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, actually. I'm going to talk about remember. And all those memories of, of our great brother Grady and, and uh, just the flow in the Holy Ghost. The dependence on the Holy Ghost. The confidence in the power of the Holy Ghost. Being a spirit-filled church. This is one of the only spirit-filled churches this side of Fort Worth, right? Uh, operating in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Praying for people to be filled. Giving prophetic words. You got a big river. <laughs> big river kept flowing in this house. Come on, say praise God. Come on, praise God. Deep river. Wide river. Yeah. That's who you are. You know, I was thinking that this church make has made and is making a tremendous transformation in America and Jamaica. I wonder if you realize that. There's a connection here. The work of wall builders came out of this house, right? And you really can't go any of the 50 states and even beyond where people don't remember and recognize the teaching of first it started with, with, with Pastor Grady then went on to David Barton, right? And the, the, the idea that God has a purpose in this nation. And when many others had forgotten, you never forgot. You have prayed, you have fought, you have stood in the gap, you have prayed for America. You have taught the Christian principles of America right here in this little town. Is that right? When nobody knew about it. When, when David Barton was traveling thousands of miles with his entire family in the darkness of night from little church to little church, you guys prayed. You believed. You felt that the prophetic words and the prophecies and the scriptures that was in the very foundation of this nation meant something. You continue to contend every Tuesday, right? You were praying. Prayed for America. So we got to remember. Look at your neighbor and say, we need to remember. We need to remember. Remember the legacy of what the Lord has in this house. I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. I want to show you some pictures of Jamaica in just a minute, and we'll get to that. But I, I want you to, I want <laughs> Pastor, Pastor uh, Knox sort of, uh, when he prayed a while ago, he sort of unlocked something here. Let's flow in that. Come on, amen? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, said something powerful. A lot of times people focus on the second part of that verse. The verse talks about the fact that God said to the children of Israel that you should remember the Lord your God. Can you read it? Does anybody have it? 
And you, just me, individually, we shall what? Remember the Lord your God. You know that the enemy doesn't want you to remember the Lord your God. The enemy would rather you remember your bills. Remember who stabbed you in the back. Remember, you know, your, 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 your toe. Remember something that happened to you when you are two years old. Here you are, seven years old. And the enemy would want you to remember where you were at three. But he doesn't want you to remember the Lord your God. Remember, you know, a lot of what the devil does is to try to get us to forget. He works to get us to not know what we ought to know. And if we had any knowledge of what we ought to know, he resort to all kind of tactics to get us to forget. I mean, we have one, this, one black and white television station I can tell you about. People would, you know, stick out their neck. And we call them rubber neck when somebody dies on the road or something. You know, stick out their neck to try to see what's going on. Now we have thousands of channels in the homes. And yet, the people are bored. People have mental issues. Drug use is skyrocketing. Suicide is skyrocketing. We have never been more entertained before than we are today. But you know, it's funny because when you look in some languages, the word entertainment is distraction. It's distraction. See, the enemy entertains us to try to get us from thinking about what God wants us to think. And so all these, I'm thinking like, man, how many plays can people produce? How many movies? I, I, I didn't realize that the shows that are on television, that you could actually open up a television station and just play reruns. I thought there were people making fresh movies in Hollywood. I realized that the enemy has set up opportunities now we have internet and dark web, gray web, whatever kind of web. He is constantly working to get our thinking away from God. Away from God. Sicknesses come against our bodies. It's another attempt to get us to focus on the sickness than on the healer. Broken relationship is another attempt to get us to focus on people than on God. Even in our own brokenness and sin and when we are tempted, the enemy wants us to think that we are the problem and this one is the problem and other things are the problem. Why? Because he doesn't want us to focus on what God says. Why is there fighting and rumors and division? We went to an area in Jamaica. I was so surprised. We went, we did what we call a listening tour because our friendly city in Montego Bay is now a very deadly place. Violence and gang and all. And, and so we've been going in as pastors. We went into one of the really bad areas. We walked. We brought people together in the church. We were listening to them, praying with them. And I was shocked to find out that the reason why many of those people said it before was they were victims of crime. And do you know what motivated the, cr the criminals? I thought it was the scamming. I thought it was gangs, gang manship. I, I thought it was all... Do you know what it was? Jealousy. Bad mind. Covetousness. Envy. Somebody had a nice position in the tourist. They had a nice bus. That was doing good. And somebody says, I want that money. So I need to get rid of him. I want that husband. 
I need to get rid of her. Jealousy, envy. Why do you think the enemy stirs up jealousy, envy, division? Why does he do that? It's a distraction. Because the Bible says we wrestle not against people. Against flesh and blood. Did it not? And it clearly told us and tells us where and where we need to take the fight. We need to take the fight, the Bible says, to principalities. Thought structures. That's what principalities are. Principles that have developed in people's mind to keep them in bondage. Take the fight to there. But he doesn't want us to. He wants us to fight each other. Then he says, take the fight to powers. The Lord really been dealing with my heart. And we see that. A lot of the demo de demo democratic principles around the world is being erased and replaced by oligarchies. Groupings of men and women or organizations with power who want to control. And many of those people and organizations with power, their knees are not bowed to Christ as king. And the people have no say. Powers. But they're not the individual. What happened is that they are demonic spirit that is seeking to remove the individuality of people. That's demonic. So we focus on the powers. When the Bible says that there are, there are spiritual wickedness of this age. You're able to say this age. You've got to understand that the demonic work today is going to be different from the 1940s. But can I tell you, they are not more powerful than the ones that operated in the 1940s. I've got a big news today. There are no new demons. There are no new demons. All demons were trampled under the feet of Jesus Christ. He made captivity captive. Jesus Christ is Lord. There are no 21st century Google 10.5 AI whatever demons that is above Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't allow that devil to cause us to forget. And we need to remember. Come on, amen? We must not forget who Jesus is. We must not forget that he did come. That he did die on the cross. Hallelujah. Jesus did go down to the depths of hell. Jesus did take away the keys of death and hell. Jesus did destroy principalities and made a show of them openly. Don't allow the enemy to cause you to forget that. The victory that we are looking for is not in the second coming of Jesus. The victory that we are looking for, friend, has already been done by Jesus at his first coming. He is not coming to be the king. He is the king. He's not coming to defeat Satan. He has defeated. Oh, but he don't want us to remember that. He don't want us to remember that. Come on, are you with me? He don't want us to remember that. I was thinking the other day, why did Jesus... Not just get into Jerusalem, work with Mary and Joseph, you know, learn some things about carpentry and learn obedience for 30 years and just be with Mary and Joseph, you know. And then he get up one morning, the anointing came upon him, you know, just, you know, he got a nice uh, Arabian stallion and just rode into Jerusalem and just went up to Golgotha, jump off Golgotha, told the soldiers, you know, hold my jacket and so the prophecy will be fulfilled. Okay, here I am, put me on the cross. Go ahead, take your best shot. I'm already dead. Sorry, I gave it. Why didn't he just take it in control and just go up there and shed his own blood and just do it and, and, and just get it up? Why did he have to suffer so? 
Why did Jesus have to allow them to take uh, the shirt off his back to strip him almost naked? Why did he allow them to beat him with that, with that, that whip? As Isaiah said, he was unrecognizable. Why did he suffer so? Why? Why didn't he just go from start to finish? The Bible tells us that because he wanted to be our high priest. He wanted to suffer like human beings are suffering in the earth today. He wanted to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus wanted to address every demon that worked in the earth. He wanted to deal with the demons that attacked, attacked us emotionally. So when he was in the garden, he cried out and he had pressure. You ever had pressure? Oh, my friend, Jesus went there. Come on, say Jesus went there. He went there so that you can come back from there. All the sicknesses was upon him. They didn't just put a crown on his head. They pushed it in his skull. All our headaches, all our brain problems. I'm here to tell you, Jesus knows. Jesus is a friend of the suffering man and woman. Jesus is a friend of people. Jesus can identify you show me any conqueror, any ruler, any religious leader, they isolate themselves from the suffering of the people. Not Jesus. He made himself. Huh? He took on the form of mankind. I'm here to tell you that every sickness and every pain you feel in your body, you can expect healing from it. Did you hear me? Why? Because Jesus took the time to feel it. Oh, come on, give Jesus a praise. Come on, take a minute and just give him thanks. He took the time. Oh, Jesus, thank you. You know, there was one preacher who gave up the full gospel of Jesus, turned him back on the, full, on the, on the, uh, the integrity of the scriptures, he said there was too much suffering in the world. He saw people starving in, in, in Africa, in Kenya, I think it was at the time. And he said, there's just too much suffering for there to be a God and for, for God to have, for there to be a heaven or hell. No, he forgot. That, that's why Jesus suffered. And that's why this gospel of the kingdom must be preached all over the world. Because this gospel of Jesus, this good news of the coming of Jesus... It opens the eyes of the blind. It sets at liberty them that are bruised. It brings captives out of prison. It gives hope to the hopeless. It heals the brokenhearted. This gospel is what the world needs. We are not looking for it to happen. It has already happened. But the devil wants us to forget. The Lord says, you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is He who gives you the power. My friends, once you forget, then the devil knows he's got you in territory where you have no power. See, once you are outside of Jesus' power, then you are relying on your own power, your own intellect, your own knowledge, your own money. You can group together and farm an army. You can group together and build a tower like Babel, where we can big together and we'll build a corporation and we'll do it. We'll be vigilante, get us some guns and we go fix it ourselves. But the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. So we have to depend on Jesus. 
Because we are not fighting against other people. We need Jesus against principalities. We need Jesus against the powers we face today. We need Jesus against the spirit of darkness of this age. We need Jesus against the spiritual wickedness in high places. But with Jesus, come on, say, but with Jesus, all things are possible. Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah, somebody. All things are possible. Not my own, but your will. John the Baptist says, I must decrease, but he may, might increase. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men. He'll give you the victory. You just got to remember the Lord. You know, the good thing about remembering the Lord is he has done such an awesome job to make his word available to us. Sometimes we throw the Bible away and he sends a person in a car with a bumper sticker in front of us. We can see the scripture. Huh? Or like the lady who was upset because her daughter was in an accident. She was cursing God. I said, how could you make this happen to my daughter? She slumped over after cursing God. And she, in the stillness of the silence and her exhaustion, she heard the voice of God say, well, at least you're talking to me. That's our God. Come on, that's our God. That's our God. God loves us. But what the devil wants us to do in a marriage is to forget the love. In a church, to forget the vision. Now, the Lord says, remember the Lord your God, for is it is he who will give you what? Huh? He gives you what? Come on, say power. Can I tell you that a lot of the problems in the world today is a search for power? Somebody wants the power. I mean, even in a marriage, somebody wants the final say. Come on. Children, you know, if you're not careful, you think you run the house. That boy or that little, if they, they know how to wield the power. <laughs> huh? They know which buttons to push. They know which emotion is like a big old elephant, little string. My friends, what have you done with your power? I'm saying, my prayer the last is, Lord, give me back the power. I want 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 to be able to operate in the power. Oh, Jesus says in the book of Luke, I give you power over all the powers of the enemy. In Matthew 28, 16, it says, all authority, all power has been given unto me, Jesus says. Then he says, go. So all authority has been given to the church. Come on, amen. He says, I give to you, in Matthew 16, the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. He said, the gates of hell. Shall not prevent. You got to remember these things, friend. The devil batter us. He beats us. He kicks us. He lies to us. He tries to manipulate us. He overwhelms us. He tries to use psychological manipulation and in psychological in and all kind of indoctrination and all kind of things because he wants us to forget. He doesn't want you to remember that you have the power. Or that God is the source of your power. You know, the devil doesn't mind you depending on the government. As long as you just don't depend on God. The devil doesn't mind you depending on your mother or father. As long as you don't depend on, on God. The devil doesn't mind you depend on your stocks or whatever. Whatever you want to depend on. He doesn't mind you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just depend. Just don't depend on God. You don't mind you depending on people or all these things. Jesus says in Matthew 6, seek ye first. Seek ye first. Seek ye first. Come on, say seek ye what? He didn't say there's not a place for government or for people. He didn't say that. But the first is the Lord. 
Remember the Lord. Put him first. The problem in America is there has been a sense of pride that people have developed. And I think because we are Americans, we're going to do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want, because we are. No, my friends, there is a God. Remember the Lord, your God. Ironically, the, the, the actual fruit of America that many are benefiting from today started out from people who knew the Lord, their God. So isn't that something? I pick the apple off your tree, then I'm going to make you an apple pie and put poison in it. Does that make sense? <laughs> That's what the devil does. That's what people do today. You know, they stand on the shoulders of pastors and missionaries and godly people and they want to stick you in the eye with it. But that's the devil. He has no respect of people. So the Lord says this in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 29. This is after Jeremiah 29 where the Lord talks about the plan. This is when... Israel was still in bondage. This is when they were still under the oppression of the enemy. But my friend, even though Israel was under the oppression of the enemy, there were a remnant of people whose attention was not on what the enemy was doing. Listen to me. They were not focused on the enemy. They kept their focus on God. One of them was Jeremiah. Is that right? Jeremiah kept his focus on the Lord. He remembered the Lord. In fact, when he was time and he was giving the prophecy, Jeremiah says, oh, it's going to be another 70 years before we go back. Man, they wanted to stone him. Because that was not politically correct, was it? I mean, here you are under oppression, and the guy said 70 more years. No, 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 no. In fact, one of the false prophets came and took this symbol of a yoke that Jeremiah had on around his neck, and they broke the yoke, and he went on national television and said, we're going to be free tomorrow. Well, you know, he said, we're going to be free tomorrow. Jeremiah said, oh, no, you better get back and rewrite that post in the New York Times and tell them it's going to take 70 years to get out of this problem. And they said, we're going to throw you in a hole, Jeremiah. <laughs> Listen, church, don't compromise because of what the world is doing. Stay committed to the covenant that you have with God. The enemy wants you to forget the covenant. He wants us to compromise the covenant. But I'm here to remind you today, let's remember the covenant. Amen? What was the covenant? The Lord said this in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. In the middle of all of that, he says, there is coming a day. Hallelujah. Come and look at your neighbor and say, there is coming a day. There is coming a day when they shall no more say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. My friend, that's why this gospel is preached. So that there will be a day when fathers will not suck sour grapes and children will not be separated from their heritage because the fathers suck sour grapes. The very next verse says, because in that day, look at verse 20 with me. Thank you, sir. The days are coming. Say the days are coming. Come on, say the days are coming. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Next, verse, verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land. My covenant which they broke. Um, which, though I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. Keep going. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days. What did he say? 
I will put my law where? So we're going to remember. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to put my law where? In their minds and in write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be. Can I tell you, my friends, that ever since the coming of Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago, this is what God has been doing in the earth. God has not been enforcing, listen to me, God has not been enforcing any generational curse. Individuals in any tribe, in any nation, in any generation can now come personally before God and be free to be what God has called them to be. In these days, it will no more, and it does not have to be said, it is no more a right to be, there is no more reason why a person's teeth should be set on edge because their fathers sucked sour grapes. In these days, the Lord says, regardless of what the devil is doing, you can be what God created you to be. You can have what God wants you to have. You know, sour, you ever hear somebody say they have sour grapes? Regret. You know how sour grapes work? Somebody has sour grapes when, say, say for you, my sister, I don't know, you, you just, but say for you, right? You know, are, are you married? You're weird, okay. So when you were married with your, with your husband, all right? Somebody liked your husband when he was a young guy or, you know, growing up or something. But then he married you. So the person who liked him has sour grapes. And now he used to be the nice guy, so charming, such a strong man. But then when he got married to you, ah, he's nothing. Look at him. Look at his head too big. He walked backwards. Looks at Suddenly, they are, you know, when you have sour grapes, nothing looks good to you. When, you have, when you're operating with sour grapes, the things that would normally appreciate because you can't have it, you pull it down. You denigrate it. You bring it to nothing. That's called sour. So the fathers, some things they didn't step into. And so there are things that were completely thrown off the table. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to throw anything off the table that God does not tell you to take off the table. Because we are operating in a time, the Bible says, where the Lord says, I will be your father. And actually what he has done is that he has made a covenant with us, the Gentiles, us who may have no Jewish blood, us through Jesus Christ. So that the promises of Abraham can be all ours. We are not half adopted into the family of Abraham. We are fully adapted. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. We cry out, not my adopted father, not my stepfather. Not my Jewish God. No. Abba. 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 The one who has dealt with principalities and powers. The one who has made a way for our victory. The one who will pick up a little boy in a little town called Poorman's Corner and say, you can be whatever I want you to be. The God who will find a person in the back of a desert and bring them wherever he wants them to. The God who will take a young girl hiding under the bed and cause her to sit on a throne. This is the day we are living in. These are the days. And the devil wants you to forget that. Oh, he don't want you to remember that. He wants you to think that we are living in the days where we suck sour grapes like our fathers where our teeth are on hedge like our forefathers 
He wants us. And every time you put your big toe out, he wants to step on your toe. Not because he just really wants to step on your toe. He doesn't really care about you. He just wants you to stay locked up. But I love what Jesus says. The Lord says, I will put my law where? In your mind and in your, come on, say in my mind and in my heart. Come on, say in my mind and in my heart. I will remember the covenant. Come on, say I will remember the covenant. Can I, do, I want to give you one more scripture. Can I say this? I want to encourage all of you here who have raised up children in this house, who have birthed nieces and nephews and younger generations in this house. It is up to you to remind them of what God has said in this house. It's up to you. Don't accept for them to reject the legacy that is in this house. Don't accept and say, well, it's one generation and another. No, 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 no. The Bible says one generation shall praise your name to the next. So I want to say to you, you know, once, sometimes it's really beautiful when you see uh, a, 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 a doctor and their children become a doctor. And um, like we have some friends that came from a, a Nigerian they, they learn to be doctors, and now because they pursued what the do, open door God gave for them, it not only changed them, it changed their entire family. Are you with me? But can I tell you, they didn't just hope it happened. They were involved in ensuring that their children connected with protected and carried on the legacy that they have. And I, I, I call myself among that. Sometimes as Christians, we are too willy-nilly and too um, carefree. It's almost like what Esau said. Esau said, I'm going to Olive Garden. You're going to buy the meal? I don't care about this birthright. Just give me a nice salad. He gave up his birthright. The Bible says he didn't pay attention to it. I call this church to pay attention to your spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-empowered, the legacy that your founders have birthed in this house. And I say sometimes it may not seem like you're winning. But I'm telling you, it's a winning legacy. It may not seem like you're doing anything, but I'm here from Jamaica telling you that the pebble that fell on this rock, that fell on this hill, there's a ripple effect in the Caribbean. It's because of you. Because of your faithfulness to the word. There is a ripple effect, my brother, you know, across the whole nation. I know friends of mine, people read the books of David Barton and learn about God's heritage in nations. It started here. Don't, those of you as you have labored and you have stood here, don't give up. Don't block up the well. You know, the guys want to block up the well. Keep the well open. Let it flow. Keep the well open. Look at your neighbor and say, keep the well open. Keep the well, this well of a leader, Cornerstone Church. This well where the Holy Spirit has flowed. And when people look at two teachers, I said, how can two teachers become pastors and say they are doing Holy Spirit work? Two short people, right? In men's eyes. Grady and Rose. They were teachers. One was a teacher. One was a, 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 a machinist. Right? Worked here in, 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 in Proctor. Is that correct? I think one of the companies, but he but worked and taught the gospel. They were bivocational, but they are tapped into a well. And I'm here to tell you today in the name of the Lord Jesus, don't forget that. Remember the Lord your God. You will have the wealth you need for God to do what you need to do. You will have the resources you need to go where God wants you to go. As long as you remember where the power comes from. Did you get that? Did you get that? 
The arm of flesh will fail us. We dare not trust our own. We must trust in the Lord. As a church, don't apologize for your faith. Don't apologize for your Holy Spirit conviction. Don't apologize for your roots in Christ. You know, I hear people say, oh, they're young people. Listen, all young people don't know the best. Some of them are stupid. I mean, I mean some of them just don't know. Not really. <laughs> just because a person is young and living in the 21st century doesn't mean they have wisdom. And by the way, just because you're older doesn't mean you have wisdom either. But if we are with God, we will have the source of wisdom. Are you with me? Don't, I hear too many old and, and aging and older folks. I've got to care for one of them. But I, I, too many of us throw away the legacy of God with a flippant word where we are in a new generation. But friends, we might be in a new generation, but we are not serving a new God. We might be in a new generation, but it's not a new Holy Ghost. We might be a new generation, but it's the word that is a lamp unto our feet. In fact, the scripture says, how can a young man, not an old man, how can a young man cleanse his way? It's to the work of the church by taking heed to the word of God. We need the gospel. So in closing, Romans 8, Romans 12. Us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, which is reasonable and acceptable unto God. It says, be not conformed to this world. Come on, say with me. Be not transformed to this world. Come on, let's stand together. But it says, be conformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is what? Good and acceptable. And the perfect will of God. I'm going to turn over to Pastor. I just want to thank you guys for standing with us at ECU. We could never be doing what we're doing in Jamaica. Just this past few months, Betty had a women's conference where over 100 women came from different places. And she talked about, the Lord led them to talk about the, the woman of promise. People were weeping at the altar as women realized that God had a promise in their lives. We have students being trained. And we have chaplains being raised up to go into schools and prison and different areas. God's using us, brothers and sisters. We're in the middle of a mall we're downstairs, they're selling drugs. On the right, this is happening, that, but, we, but they know and they have been touched by the testimony of Jesus. And we have only just begun. We have turned a dance hall into a Christian university with your help for the glory of God. We have over 100 students who are part of the ECU family. We have another over 150 who are part of our extended family you know, extension schools, and we have only just begun. It's a big work. We believe in God. Our budget for this year, we had told you $200 we were trying to survive. Now our budget is $300,000 for this year into next year. Come on. That means there's a purpose for that money. Come on, amen. Now the activities and work is calling for $300,000. And God is doing it. Will you pray for us? Continue to stand with us. We just love you guys. We appreciate you. Amen. Amen.